morning, everyone. How are you doing? Excellent. Doing very well. Very good. It's so nice to be back. I love Bangalore. I've been here three years running. But uh, show of hands, how many of you, this is your first time here at a Gids conference? Oh, I love to see that. Very nice. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. How many of you have been here two years in a row? Very nice. Very nice. Three years? Uh, fewer hands. Okay, four years. Anyone? Anyone? Venkat, raise your hand. There we go. Five years? Six years? Liar! We've only been around for five years, but I appreciate your enthusiasm. I appreciate your enthusiasm. We are here to talk about HTML5, specifically mobile development. But I chose these two topics, application cache and local storage, because they are just as applicable for desktop web developers as they are for mobile developers as well. As Usha mentioned, my background is as a Microsoft developer. I've got 15 Microsoft certifications. Then I went on to do server-side Java development, written books about JBoss, and, uh, and, and, uh, and certainly a lot of Java topics. Um, for the last five or six years or so, I've been spending time dealing exclusively with Groovy and Grails. Um, I hope to see some of you here tomorrow for my Groovy talk, metaprogramming. But for the past couple of years, or two years at least, I've been focusing almost exclusively on HTML5, and specifically HTML5 for smartphones, for tablets, and yes, even smart TVs. Now, all of your high-end TVs have an Ethernet connection, which means they have a web browser in it as well. These are exciting times to be a programmer, isn't it? Yes. So let's get one more thing out of the way here. This is very important. I need to know how many of you in here are carrying iPhones. Anyone in here iPhone users? OK, very good. How many of you are carrying Android phones? Very nice. See, we're all sitting next to each other. We can get along. It's OK, isn't it? We all get along. Yes, yes. Uh, anyone in here carrying Palm phones, WebOS phones? All oh, very nice. Microsoft phones? How many of you are carrying phones you're incredibly embarrassed about? Terribly old phones you'd never want anyone to know about? There we go. Yes, see, I tricked you again, didn't I? Yes. So while we're establishing some terminology, if you are typing on glass, that is considered a smartphone. If your phone has physical buttons on it, that's a dumb phone. No, that's not a dumb phone. That's called a feature phone. So if you have a feature phone, I can't help you. Please leave. This topic will do nothing for you at all. But if you are carrying a smartphone or doing development for smartphones, stick around. I think you'll enjoy yourself. So why have I been spending my time focusing on mobile devices, smartphones, and tablets? There are some important trends going on in the industry that I think we should be aware of. Now, I'm a big fan of Apple. Don't worry, I'm going to broaden this discussion. But I like this discussion about Apple technology because it allows me to put hard numbers on things. In quarter four, in fourth quarter of 2010, Apple sold 4.1 million computers, 4.1 million MacBook Pros, MacBook Airs, iMacs, Mac Pros, good things like that. Those are impressive numbers. That's about 4.1 million more devices than I sold in the same time frame. So that's very impressive to me. But what's especially interesting is in that same time frame, Apple sold 7.3 million iPads. Now, 2010 is a very interesting year because that's when Apple first introduced the tablet. So they sold nearly twice as many tablets as they did computers in the same quarter. But wait, there's more. They sold more than twice as many iPods in that same period. And if you've ever held an iPod Touch, you know that it's got a mobile Safari browser. It's got all the capabilities of an iPhone. You certainly can't make phone calls on it. But for web developers, it's just as important. So they sold nearly twice as many iPads, more than twice as many iPods, and four times as many iPhones in that same time period. They're selling mobile devices versus desktop computers at a ratio of about 8 to 1. Does that surprise you? How many of you thought Apple was a mobile company? No hands go up. I didn't consider it either. I considered them a desktop computing company. 
So I told you I would broaden this discussion. The reason I chose that Q4 2010 number is because that was the first time in history that smartphones outsold computers. This is an important inflection point in the industry. When smartphones outsell computers, you know something important is going on. Now, in terms of these numbers, you can see PC sales were up about 5% in terms of year-over-year -year sales. But smartphones were up over 90% in that same time period. So we begin seeing the trends. PCs aren't dead by any stretch, but the real growth in the market is in smartphones and tablets. I've got another graph up for you here. This is tracking web traffic based on the device you're using. That green line, that fairly flat line, is web traffic coming from desktop computers. That yellow line is web traffic coming from mobile devices. Morgan Stanley says those two lines are going to cross in the next year or so. What that means is if you're a web developer and you haven't thought about developing websites that are mobile friendly, you can't wait a year or two to begin thinking about this. We need to start building our mobile-friendly websites now. So when those lines do cross, you're already prepared for it. That's why I am so excited about HTML5. HTML5 is not a mobile spec, but for the first time, mobile browsers are first-class citizens. In many ways, the innovation that's going on is not in desktop browsers, although there's interesting things going on in Firefox and Chrome. The real innovation is going on in mobile browsers. Have I convinced you this is a real sea change? We need to start paying attention to mobile devices and not programming for them to the exclusion of desktop devices, but be aware that our websites are being more and more consumed not just from large screens with 101 keys and a mouse on the side. So as web developers, we need to make sure we provide several doors to our website. And these two technologies we're going to be talking about, app cache and local storage, are equally applicable for both desktop and mobile devices. So let's begin. Let's talk about local storage. And what this is a good resource for you. If you haven't read up on HTML5, I encourage you to check out this book, HTML5 Up and Running. Mark Pilgrim is the author. He's got a wonderful sense of humor. I'm going to steal many of his jokes in this presentation. But the reason why I offer you this book is because the entire contents of the book are available to you free online as well. If you go to dive into html5.info, dive into html5.info. The entire contents of this book are available for you. If you enjoy the online material, if you enjoy reading it for free, I encourage you to go and buy a real copy of it. But in the meantime, if you want to learn more about these topics, this is an excellent resource for you. So let's begin talking about local storage. And to talk about local storage, we first need to talk about cookies. Now, most people think of cookies as a persistence mechanism for HTML, a really bad persistence mechanism for HTML. In fact, it's not about persistence as much as it is about providing a persistent connection. HTTP is a fundamentally stateless protocol. When I type in www.yahoo.com, the server says, hi, who are you? I'm Scott. I'd like this page, please. And then when I click on a link, the server says, hi, who are you? I'm Scott. I was just here. I'm reading page two. Yeah. And then I click on another link. It says, hi, who are you? Leave me alone, right? I am Scott Davis. So what we need, see how excited I am about this topic? So what we need is a way to provide persistence for a fundamentally stateless protocol. And that's what cookies bring to the party. Each cookie is sent back and forth with each individual request. So the server doesn't say, hi, who are you anymore? The first time I log in, I have a tiny token that I send back and forth. And it is a tiny token. Cookies only allow you 4K of space. Now, they allow you 4K of space per domain. So Yahoo gets 4K, Google gets 4K, Microsoft gets 4K, Apple gets 4K. But everyone only gets 4K. The reason I'm bringing this up is because everyone likes cookies, don't they? 
That's a nice friendly visual metaphor, but I want to offer up a different visual metaphor for you. I want you to think of cookies as a rusty old thimble. If you're very thirsty, imagine trying to quench your thirst drinking out of a thimble. You'll be drinking a lot of thimblefuls, aren't you? So, local storage looks like this. Ah, yes, a hip flask, right? Now, local storage is not going to replace your server-side databases, Oracle, Microsoft, SQL. Those are your kegs. That's a keg of Kingfisher beer up on your server. But local storage is a hip flask, just enough to get you through the day, or in Dr. Subramaniam's case, just enough to get you through breakfast. Yes. But it's certainly more than drinking Kingfisher out of a thimble, isn't it? Yes. So, let's begin. Local storage, what's nice about local storage is it is widely available. It's available across all mobile browsers. It's available across all desktop browsers. Yes, even Internet Explorer 8 and beyond. So what's interesting about local storage is it's not a relational database. We will talk about relational databases in just a little bit. But local storage, in fact, is a key value store. If you've been paying attention to trends in the industry, the NoSQL revolution is well underway. If you're using MongoDB or Cassandra or my personal favorite, CouchDB, all of those are not relational databases. All of those are key value stores. They're big hash maps up in the sky. What local storage is, is not a big hash map in the sky. It's a big hash map down in your browser. So the way that works is this. This is called, again, stolen shamelessly from Mark Pilgrim's book. Actually, stolen shamelessly from his online website. Um, what he's doing in his book is he's building a game called Halma. Halma is kind of like an Othello or a goal, moving chips around on the board. And so you can see he wants to store whether that game is progress or not. This is a key, and then the value is right over here. It's very much like writing to a hash map. This is a hash map, but it's a durable hash map. By writing to local storage, this data will hang around even if you shut down your browser and come back to it a week later. That information is still there. There's another API that is identical to local storage called session storage. But as the name implies, when you shut down the browser, the data goes away as well. So if you wanted this to be just long enough for the session to end, then you can use session storage. But if you want this to live across sessions, across browser invocations, local storage is what you should be using. This again is Mark Pilgrim's sense of humor. He says the answer to the questions are five megabytes, quota exceeded error, and no. I don't even need to tell you what the questions are, do they? It's intuitively obvious. OK, I'll tell you the answers to the questions anyway. The first question is, how much storage space do we get Per instance, per domain, Microsoft.com gets 5 megabytes of local storage. Google.com gets 5 megabytes. Yahoo.com gets 5 megabytes. Now, that doesn't sound like very much when we're thinking in terms of terabyte hard drives. But you have to realize that going from 4K to 5 megabytes, those are orders of magnitude in terms of improvement. And since local storage is a text store. We're storing strings in here. You can fit a lot of textual data in five megabytes. It's not going to replace your Oracle database, but it is certainly a vast improvement over what I got with cookies. Five megabytes is what you get consistently across all browsers. That might change in the future, but today for right now, every browser on the planet gives you five megabytes. Yes? Let me, uh, let me uh, 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 repeat, your, repeat your question. Um, it sounds like I'm telling you to not use cookies and use local storage. Is that a fair summarization of your question? No, no. It's uh, like you say, it's better to go with local storage than with cookies. Why so? So um, th this is a very good question. I am certainly not telling you that it's better to use local storage than cookies. What I am telling you, and thank you so much for asking this question, is we need to use each technology for its appropriate purposes. 
Cookies are sent back and forth with every request response cycle. So when I'm logging into a website, cookies continue to be the appropriate technology solution. But as I'm going to show you here, when I'm creating an address book in a browser, I don't want that address book being sent back and forth with each request. So local storage gives you a new set of options where historically you might have used cookies. We now have a second option available to us, local storage. Is that a fair, uh, fair answer? Thing. Please. <laughs> um, what is uh, the mechanism of storing this information in the background? What it actually does? Stay tuned. I'll demonstrate for that you're right now. Thank okay, you very much for you. your questions. So the first question is we get five megabytes for all domains. The second question is what happens if you try to store more than five megabytes? You get a quota exceeded error. In JavaScript, you can have try-catch blocks just like you can in Java. So if you're worried about exceeding these errors, it's entirely appropriate to wrap your local storage calls in a try-catch block so you don't get this dreaded error. And if you do get the error, you can uh, react to it and deal with it appropriately. The third answer is no. And the question is, can I ask the user to grant me more space? Currently, the answer is no. If you're dealing with other browser um, persistent solutions like flash storage or even web SQL coming up here all of those give you the ability to prompt the user for additional space that is not the case in local storage local storage is meant to be intentionally a incredibly simple API I'll give you more sophisticated solutions in a moment for right now the best thing to think about when you're dealing with local storage think of it as a durable hash map think of it as a hash map that lives across browser invocations. So, let me now show you what this looks like live. So, I have a browser up and running, and I have an address book in here right now. As I begin adding people to my address book, you might think that I am round tripping to a server back and forth. In fact, I do not have an internet connection right now. So, as I type in names in here. Venkat, do I really have to type in your entire last name? I'm a very short time frame. I don't have this. All right. Subram. Did your parents have to use every letter in the alphabet in spelling your last name? Oh, all right. But at any rate here, this is information that is being stored locally. I have now used up 4.9 megabytes thanks to my good friend Venkat Subramaniam. Um, if we want to see what this looks like under the covers, I can pull up the web inspector. Now, this is me in Safari. And if I come in here and look, I can see these values are indeed being stored in my database. If you're a Firefox developer, you can bring up Firebug and see the same things. If you're a Microsoft developer, an Opera developer, all of these browsers support this technology, and you can view them through the developer tools. But more importantly, let's turn around and look at the source and see what it looks like to actually implement these kinds of things. There we go. So the first thing we need to look at, ooh, that's a little too big, isn't it? There we go. A little bit better here. OK, so the first thing we have to look at here is a form. And we can see this form has a first name field, a last name field, and an add button. And indeed, we see a first name field, a last name field, and an add button. Normally, when you submit, this would be a URL that would go off to a server somewhere, http something dot something dot com. In fact, what we are doing now is persisting this locally. And by the way, if this intrigues you, I encourage you to join me after lunch for my Backbone presentation, backbone.js, where we'll get an opportunity to talk a lot more about the architectural patterns of a single page web application, a single page client side app. This is just a hint right now of what's coming for you after lunch. But you can see that on submit, I'm going to call the create entry method. And so if we come in here and look at create entry, what I am going to do in this is I am going to create a new JSON object, JavaScript object notation. I'm going to create a new JSON object. I, it's a key value store, so I need to give it a key. And in this case, I'm faking it out. I'm just giving it a new date and calling get time, which gives me the current time in milliseconds. 
unless you are an incredibly fast typist. This is guaranteed to be unique across all of your form submissions. But if you don't want to use this, there are lots of other things you could do. You could use a UUID or a GUID. You could use some kind of natural key like a credit card number or a social security number. But the important thing here is I am creating a key and then my values, first name and last name, are coming directly out of that form. Once I have a well-formed JSON object, I can call local storage set item. That's what's saving it to local storage. I told you that local storage is a string store. So what I have to do is I have to serialize that JSON to a string in order to save it. Later on, when I show the list, you'll see that I will do a JSON parse. Here we are, JSON parse, to reconstitute that as I pull it out of the database. So all of this information is available to you online, but the most important thing for you to recognize is as you are doing data entry, here's my six-year-old daughter, and here is my 10-year-old son. There we go. They're all being stored now locally in that local storage. Yes, please. Where is all this data stored? That's a very good question. It's because uh, this is not uh, much different than having a dynamic uh, JSON-based object in plain JavaScript. The thing uh, which differs local storage from plain JavaScript mm -hmm. is the thing that when you close the browser, you still have it cached somewhere. Yes. Where is it? Is it uh, based on cookies or what? No, it's absolutely not based on cookies. It's dependent on what browser you're using. I can tell you Safari and Chrome and the WebKit browsers are storing this in an internal uh, SQLite database under the covers. I don't know how Microsoft is persisting it. I don't know how Firefox is persisting it. But each one of them are storing them in a durable way. So when I shut down the browser, gone, and open it back up again, that information is still there. Is persisted. Yes. Yes, and uh, does it mean that uh, this local storage is supported only in modern browsers? Yes, the very first slide I showed you, it's supported in IE8. I was late, and, I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's just fine, and these slides are available to you online as well. Okay, thank you. Very good questions. Thank you again for the participation. So, yes. Yes. Stay tuned. I'm going to talk about this right now. I will slip you 100 rupees afterwards for keeping me moving forward in my presentation, OK? okay. This is exactly what we're going to talk about right now. So excellent question. Quick question. So, uh, just one more stuff. I mean, how do we overwrite here? <laughs> here in the Fed. How do we over make sure that you know, when we access different domains, that it doesn't go and overwrite the, you know, the local story that we write out, given that we are following hash map stuff. The, the, the question is, how do we make sure that each domain gets its own data store? Absolutely. That's built into the browser. Well, how do you do that with cookies? You don't. The browser yes. just takes care of that. This is a cookie on steroids. This is a cookie that is big and strong, but it, it has all of the same rules in terms of the browser manages those individual domains. And even if it is within the same domain, how do we make sure that we kind of, we have to make, always keep track of what kind of JSON pattern we are writing out? Or? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Mm, that's... Yes. You're a big fan of relational databases, aren't you? That's what we're going to talk about right now here. So in addition to local storage and session storage, we have another kind of persistence available to us, actually two more that we're going to talk about. One of them is called the Web SQL spec. Now you will notice that your Web SQL is a true relational database available to you in the browser. But there are two very important holdouts. Whereas local storage has virtually universal support, Web SQL is supported across all the WebKit browsers. And for me, what I'm interested in is all the mobile devices, all my smartphones and tablets. Where it is not supported is Firefox and IE. And this goes back to your question right here. It's because everyone who does implement this implements it because they're already using a SQLite database. It doesn't mean this spec is deprecated. It means that because we weren't able to build a consensus 
It's at kind of a standstill right now. But browsers who do implement it, fully implement it, I would encourage you to continue to use it, especially for mobile developers. This is an outstanding solution. Uh, Amazon um, uses it for their Kindle Cloud Reader. When you're pulling in information over there, they use this kind of thing extensively. Yeah. So I don't need to tell you what database calls look like. We're all very familiar with this. What's interesting are these calls are going on in JavaScript in your browser. The same rules apply. Each domain gets its own data store. But we have now gone from 5 megabytes to 30 megabytes of database storage. And you can start it out incrementally. And as your database begins to fill up, your browser will prompt the user, are you willing to grant this website another 5 megabytes, another 5 megabytes, another 5 megabytes? So this one does grow over time. But as we look at the source code, we start up a transaction, and then we have our execute SQL statement right in there. This is what it looks like to do inserts. This is what it looks like to do selects out of this. Again, I'm not going to waste your time. You are all intimately familiar with SQL, aren't you? What's nice about this is this is available to us in the browser. Now the two holdouts, Microsoft and Mozilla, Microsoft and Firefox. Microsoft has chosen not to implement this because SQLite is a GPL bit of software. They're not touching that with a 10-foot pole. They could turn around and choose to implement it using Access Lite or Microsoft SQLite or something like that. They haven't chosen to do that. But the Firefox folks theoretically should be able to use SQLite. The reason they chose not to implement it, I love this. It offends their delicate sense of aesthetics. They say it offends us for you to suggest that we would incorporate a 20th century technology like a database in a 21st century browser. So in fact, they said we have no plans to implement a local SQL database in Firefox. What we are advocating, we Mozilla are advocating, is not the Web SQL standard, but as you can see here, the index DB standard. And while I said earlier that local storage is like a cookie on steroids, index DB is like local storage on steroids. Index DB is everything that local storage is not. Local storage is synchronous. Index DB is asynchronous. Local storage doesn't offer you any kind of transaction support. Index DB offers you transaction support. So this is a much more robust version of local storage. And that's not to disparage local storage. As I said, local storage is simply a durable hash map. Index DB is much closer to what you would expect, gives you much closer feature parity to your couch DBs, your Cassandras, your MongoDBs, things like that. So Firefox has had the longest support for this. So if you really want to play around with it, I encourage you to download Firefox. This is what the code looks like. We're still beginning with JSON, but now when we open our database, we have callbacks on success. This is the asynchronous nature of it. Go off and begin doing these kinds of things. When we're doing selects from our database, we create a cursor. And we iterate through these things. And as long as that cursor returns true, we can continue to iterate through these kinds of things. Index DB is going to give you much larger storage space as well. It's hard to say what every browser is going to give you because not every browser supports it. But it should be on the order of 30 megabytes or so, something similar to Web SQL, rather than 5 megabytes for local storage. So I'm spending less time talking about Web SQL and less time talking about IndexedDB. IndexedDB is coming. And a year from now when I'm back, I'll talk about this in great detail because at that point it'll have universal support. Currently right now, Firefox has support for it. Chrome has support for it. When IE10 ships, they're going to be offering support for it. At that point, you have about 90% of the desktop market. Then I find it interesting as a web developer. I would imagine if the three majors have it, Apple will turn around and implement it as well and we'll have nearly universal support. I don't have any hands on with it because I'm spending my time over here in mobile browsers. 
it's not available on any mobile browser that I'm aware of, so I don't have any real hands-on with it. But I can tell you we are using local storage and Web SQL quite a bit in the various projects I'm working on. So that is the persistence story, the local storage story, session story, Web SQL, and IndexedDB. Now let's talk about the other side of the coin, application cache. Every solution I've given you up to this point is all about storing user data, storing my address book information. Application cache is about storing web artifacts. This is what you use to store your HTML, your CSS, your JavaScript, your images. All of the web artifacts are stored in application cache. Now, historically, the way we got our browser to hold on to these things were through server-side hints. You would put far future expires headers on your artifacts. You'd tell your browser to hold on to this for the next 10 years. In fact, application cache gives you the same capabilities. But for mobile browsers, this means when you flip into airplane mode, when you manually disconnect from the internet, your web application continues to function. So much so that if you're in airplane mode and you tap on an icon on your screen, that could be a web application. If it's using local storage and application cache, you can do native-like development on your smartphones using the web technology stack. By using app cache, your website continues to function even when you don't have an internet connection. This is huge. This is huge. Now you can see once again we have fairly good support for this. In this case, Microsoft is the only holdout. I am hoping that they will incorporate this in IE10 when it comes out. Then we can begin using this. But what you have to recognize here is this is all about using your website when you're offline. If you can't do that in the Internet Explorer, well, it's not a showstopper. If you can't do it on a mobile phone or a tablet, it's a complete showstopper. So being able to use app cache on your smartphones and tablets are a huge win. It's well supported. So I gave you Mark Pilgrim's book as a resource. I want to give you another resource for you as well, HTML5 Rocks. Dot com. HTML5 rocks.com. That's not hyperbole. It, it does indeed rock. But this is a great website for you. Lots of good tutorials, lots of good code examples that you can run and exercise in your browsers. You're learning these things. So I was stealing shamelessly from Mark Pilgrim earlier. I'm going to steal shamelessly from the good folks at HTML5 rocks to walk you through application cache. The way app cache works is you create a manifest file. How many of you are Java developers in here? Good, 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 good. You know that when you jar up your Java code or war it up or ear it up, you end up with a manifest file in that jar file, don't you? It's a plain text list that lists all of the elements inside of that jar. This is identical conceptually to the manifest you're used to dealing with in jars, wars, and years. Notice that you specify the manifest in the HTML, in the root element, the root node of your document. Then what you do is this. This is what the manifest actually looks like. You have three main sections in this manifest file. Now you're probably not going to be hand creating this. You're probably going to be using your build script to auto generate it. But what you can do is you can say, all right, these elements in the cache section I want you to explicitly hold on to this browser. So what happens is when your browser encounters this as the first element, the next thing it's going to download is the manifest file, and the next thing it's going to download after that are all of the elements explicitly listed in your cache section. So even if you, the user, haven't visited that page yet, if it's listed in your app cache, it will already be local on your browser, so you will improve performance for your end users. 
Remember, this is true for desktop developers as well. This is why this is so important. We always want to aggressively cache our artifacts as web developers. And this is a way that we can give better performance to our end users by having our browser pre-download all of the artifacts that they are going to quite possibly request some point in the future. That's the cache section. The network session is a way for you to say, listen, these are the links that the user is going to click on where you must be online. So when I see artifacts listed in the network section, it means if a user clicks on a link to login.php, you have to be online in order to click that. If you click that link when you're in airplane mode, your browser is going to pop up a dialog saying, I'm sorry, you must be online in order to view this resource. So if we have cache, which is what's available to us when we're offline, if we have network, which is what's available to us when we're online, the third section, fallback, is the best of both worlds. In your fallback section, what you say is, listen, if I'm online, please go ahead and serve up main.py. If I am offline, serve up this resource instead. What's especially interesting about this is if I request any image from this path, any image that's in the images large subdirectory, when I'm online, go ahead and pass that through, serve it up. But if I am offline, seamlessly replace any of those images with offline.jpg. Do you see the sophistication of this? This is all handled at the browser level. So you don't have to worry about handling this in JavaScript. You don't have to worry about handling this as a developer. You are deferring all that functionality to the browser. A really, really powerful API. Please go ahead. file and we are adding duplicate entries yes. which is already there in our final HTML build which we are giving it to client. So wouldn't it be better if we send out the final build HTML file which has some of the attributes also giving indication to the client browser that these things are meant to be cached and these things are meant to be a uh, fallback thing. Why I, think it you're is missing, I think you're missing one important point. I'm sorry for cutting you off, but I only have five minutes left. So let me answer this very, very quickly. And then if, if that doesn't do it for you, we can talk about it more after the presentation. What this is, is this preloads your entire website, whatever artifacts you list here. You are correct that when the browser downloads an individual web page, your browser already downloads all the artifacts associated with that page. But if you have 50 pages in your website, there is no HTML technology that will generate that. What you would have to do as a developer is start generating AJAX requests to download them seamlessly behind the scene. That's a lot of work. It's entirely possible, but it's a lot of work for you to bite off as a developer. Whereas this is a huge convenience. It uh, defers all of that functionality to the browser. You don't have to worry about it anymore as a developer. True, but when we are talking about single page application, the things remains good, right? Let's talk about this more over at Kingfisher after the meeting tonight. Okay. Fair enough? Thanks. Yes. So there are lots of other things we can do with this API as well. And I really do apologize. I love the questions. I love the interaction. We only have 45 minutes. I'm already giving you 90 minutes of material in 45 minutes. So thank you so much. It's an excellent question. And I'm not giving your very good question justice up here as a presenter. And I do apologize. There is a very robust API associated with this. There are a number of states we can worry about in app cache. Either it's been loaded or idle or checking or downloaded. We can switch case our way through this. Notice that as well. We can listen to the state and programmatically. So as a developer, you're not losing control. In fact, you as a developer can completely control the life cycle. You can manually request that a new cache is downloaded. And there are event listeners, so once that cache event is done asynchronously, you can react and continue moving forward. So I do share your concerns. I do know. I do think your concerns are unfounded. This doesn't take control away from you as a developer. It gives you a much richer set of interactions with the browser. So 
when it comes to app cache storage, we've talked now that cookies give you 4K, almost nothing. Local storage gives you 5 megabytes. Web SQL gives you 30 megabytes. We'll see what IndexedDB gives you, but it should be on that same order of 30 megabytes. When it comes to app cache, it is all over the map. When it comes to Safari on the desktop, you get unlimited storage. When it's mobile Safari, you're capped at 10 megabytes. This makes sense to me as a developer. I have giant terabyte hard drives on my computer. I have limited resources on my mobile device. So this seems like a fair compromise to me. That said, I have no idea what the Google folks are thinking with Chrome. They've got it exactly reversed. They limit your desktop browser to 5 megabytes, and they give you unlimited storage on your Android. Who knows, right? So we are all over the map on these kinds of things. Uh, he says it's about IE not because it's a terrible browser, because it doesn't support this. When IE 10 comes out, if they do support app cache, we'll have to see what arbitrary value they've chosen to store these resources. But bear in mind, even the smallest number up there, 5 megabytes, think about your website in terms of pure HTML, CSS, and JavaScript for a single page app that is all the space in the world to store your application for offline usage. And if you have five megabytes of resources and five megabytes of local storage, you've got a very compelling technology stack for writing smartphone and tablet applications. So we covered a lot of ground in a terribly short amount of time. But what we were able to cover here is all of the local persistence uh, APIs available to you in HTML5 and app cache as well. I have never been more excited to be a web developer than right now. HTML5 is a huge game changer. Did you enjoy yourself here? I did as well. Thank you very much for your time. I think we probably have time for one question. Is, is that fair? Yes? How does it work with subdomains? The same way it does with cookies. So, so, but, so yep. But so, do you have a control over like whether it should be for a, like your cookie you can control whether it should be for a subdomain or for a bigger domain. Can you do the same thing with the app cache and the local storage? I would, I would have to double check that. I haven't, I, haven't I haven't done with that. The work I'm doing right now with Time Warner Cable, we're not concerned about multiple subdomains. When you're trying to drive your smart TV from a Galaxy tab, we just have one domain in there. We're storing, we can't store two months of channel guides, but we can store the current days worth of current viewing in there. And so every time you pull up your Galaxy tab, you've got the current days programming in there. You've got all of your DVR content being stored on your set-top box. You have all your video on demand. We have all the room we need for those kinds of things. We couldn't store two weeks worth or a month's worth, but we have an appropriate amount of information. Do we have Hi. time for one more? Hi. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Yes. So we can have, uh, I can have a website displayed on a browser. Ah, thank you. Hi. Uh, on a browser, native browser of an Android phone, and would, can use the 5 MB of local storage. I can do a similar thing with a native application having a web view. Browser history and clear all the cache and history. Is there any notification that I can get or manage as a restriction at my application level for that database from being destroyed? If you pull down my slides online, I have a number of slides that talk about the differences, the benefits and drawbacks of doing native development in Java or Objective-C versus HTML. I'm not going to tell you that one is better than the other. I'm going to tell you, in, given the circumstances, one is more appropriate than the other. Fair enough. But in any case, would I be getting a notification that my database is getting deleted and I need to I mean, start my site all over again for the user? Um, the, the way your database information is going to get deleted is either programmatically in your application. You might decide to age out data. We're going to delete yesterday's television information because it's not appropriate anymore. The other way the, us the user can delete that information is by going in and clearing their cookies using the settings in the browser. So I don't think the user will lose any information without them either physically doing it or you doing it for them programmatically. Thank you once again for your time and attention. I do appreciate it. Thank you very much, Scott, for that wonderful session.
Well, uh, we'd like to request you. Uh, we've got 10 minutes of switching time between every session. So from 9.45 to 9.55 is a switching time. We'd sincerely request you not to switch halls until the switching time begins because that disturbs the Q&A session. Any more questions? So uh, uh, you told that uh, session storage, uh, there is some time to live, like you close uh, the browser window, uh, the yes. storage is not persistent. So what about the local storage? Uh, is there something of time to live or in a, some way you can clear your local storage? No, and this is a very important distinction. With cookies, you put a specific time to live on them. Session storage lives based on the browser lifecycle. When you shut down the browser, it goes away. Local storage is meant to be durable. So there's no way that the information will age out. Think of it more like a relational database. Microsoft SQL or Oracle or Postgres would never age out your database. It's meant to be durable. So local storage follows that same uh, mental model. Not even programmatically, you can uh, clear your storage? You can clear your storage, yeah, by going in and clearing your cookies, clearing your cache. The user can go in and empty that, but there's nothing that will just naturally age that data out. It's meant to be a long-lived, durable, persistent store. So uh, how does it, like, uh, after 5 MB is complete, uh, so is there a way that a browser itself uh, moves out some of the uh, data which is not being referenced for some time? No, when we're talking about browser cache artifacts like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, the browser uses kind of a FIFO method, first in, first out, ages those things out. This is very different. This is not meant application cache. That data won't age out either by having... <laughs> SQL is the same thing, index DB is the same thing. All of those things will be there until either the user deletes that information or you programmatically delete it. Okay, thanks. Programmatically, um, yes, you can clear the cache. I had to think about it, but yes, there's an API that... So yeah, through the, through the JavaScript API for app cache, I can do that. Uh, hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Scott? Yes. <laughs> yes, Scott. Uh, how about it works for uh, Google Maps or uh, Bing Maps like an application? Um, Google Maps probably wouldn't use something like this um, because um, you know the whole point of Google Maps is making sure that when you're online, you can dynamically search those kinds of things. Google yeah. Maps continues to use far future expires headers for those things. Uh, suppose, this is for information uh, that you want to be available to you when you're offline. Okay. Suppose uh, I'm developing an, uh, my own uh, mapping application. So how about it works along with the uh, database? Um, what you would, you would continue to use there is a um, uh, far future expires headers. So best of luck to you with that. I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Subramaniam now. Thank you once again for your enthusiasm.